Cool. Okay, so this is a bit of a demo. This is a bit of a demo of basically some code I hacked together ish a while ago now. Um, actually, I believe it was my LCO's over I really should hack on something project from last year. And I've had this idea for years. It's just finally been written. At the, it's been in the stage now for pretty much since February where the code works. I just need a hardware platform for it. Um, it got rewritten a few, uh, uh, about two months ago to actually be somewhat OO. So what it actually is, is a touchscreen, or a UI designed for touchscreen as a mid -TV remote control. It uses the mid -TV remote protocol. Um, it eventually needs to get hacked to connect to the back end, to connect to a back end, uh, because there's some fairly big things missing in the remote protocol if you want to do intelligent things. Um, this will actually show you, I mean, obviously, progress bar, how, where you've been, where you're going. Um, it will actually display the program details there. The channel guide, as you might guess, given that I'm not connected to a back end, is actually fake because there's no way to get the channel information. Um, yeah, so it's really neat. Um, it, there is a config option to just control volume. Um, I don't have that because I'm the sort of guy who buys $10,000 sound systems. Um, those usually don't have a software controllable volume. That's actually probably going to happen. Um, but it, it's basically, it's rather neat. Um, it works quite well. I, it's actually to the point where if I have my laptop near me, I'll use it instead of the, the um, straight remote control for my Mythbox. Um, admittedly, 90% of the viewing I do of my Mythbox is just mplayer, dash, mplayer HTTP blah from, from MythWeb. Um, but it's a neat idea. It's something that I need, I need to find a hardware platform for. It's really hard to find a decent small touch screen that can run anything usable. Um, the UI is GTK, as you might be able to tell from the button design. The code is only a good few, it's only a few hundred lines and it would be easily portable from its current shock horror um, PHP GTK because that happened to be the first language binding for GTK that worked. All the UI is actually in Glade, so the UI is directly portable. The code is, as I said, a few hundred lines. Um, just thought I'd show it, maybe give somebody some, somebody an idea to do a lot better than I can. Um, or point me in the way of hardware that works. Any questions or suggestions from anyone? I don't think so, primarily because I don't think gestures work as well as people. Th some people think they work. If you're the sort of person who uses a touch screen or laptop input all the time, they don't work well on those platforms. They, they, they're all right with a the mouse. They break down with nearly every other input device I've ever used, except possibly a pen. But finger gestures aren't all that great unless you've got a really good touch screen. And I don't have Apple's R&D budget. Michael? Too small a screen. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, one angle we took on something like this was a few years ago, we had a customer who had cerebral palsy and he needed a user interface for the TV. And this is a quite an interesting way to approach the user accessibility issues. What we cooked up from in the end was a web page that was a virtual remote control. Hmm. It was a little less pretty than this. But the uh, icons, or the, the buttons that we put on it were large enough that hmm. a special computer he used to have the first way his, um, his mouse button was the size of a small football. You know, this, this was a very special device. Yeah. And he could basically use his mid TV box as well as any able bodied person with a virtual remote control allowed him. Yeah. And things it, like this are great for mm. accessibility. Yeah. If anybody wants one, I've got pretty much, it looks identical, but it's a web page version. The only difference is this version has the fairly live progress indication basically achieved by doing query location at a rate of hertz um, because there's no way to subscribe to events in the remote protocol, which is another thing I think is missing. Um, I actually have a list, which if you would like it, I can, <laughs> I can send you away. Um, 
it also properly knows if you're what if you're at the main menu, the main menu button's dimmed. It only lets you do things that make sense. It only shows things that make sense. Um, unfortunately, it appears that the PHP libraries won't let me talk IPv6, or else I'd actually connect to my back end of time, a uh, front end of time. Um, but I don't leave a front. I don't leave Myth installed on the laptop. Um, you. Yeah. Um, the the image is actually off the old Myth TV theme I used to use before it broke in whatever version it broke in. Um, it just happens to be the main menu background. It's just touch screen. Video comes up on your front end. Oh, okay. This is a controller for your front end. Um, I, was, I was thinking if you were looking at a device that had that superimposed on uh, over the video, then making those transitions. Well, uh, actually doing that, so doing that as an overlay, having something like a Wiimote where you pick it up, um, actually the, the air mouse would actually possibly be better UI where you pick it up, it wakes up, the UI comes in over the top of your screen, could actually work really well because you don't have to be all that accurate. Um, on the other hand, you could just, if you're already lifting it up, you could just push the fast forward button, as <laughs> John said. Sort of Th this is useful for extra functionality, but may not necessarily be all that useful for straight one. I mean, if you've ever, I mean, these lecture theaters, for example, have the AMX, in this case, touch screens that are wonderful because you push a button, the screen comes down, the projectors go on, the audio reroutes, the video reroutes. Um, you might have a button that pulls a feed from a remote lecture theatre. That sort of stuff's really neat and getting to that level of quality with a Myth TV UI would be a great way to sell it. Uh, rather expensive in the I could buy a laptop cheaper category. I, I actually keep meaning to get around, I've got one of the OLPCs and there is a, they are apparently designed to be modified for a touch screen. Nobody happens to have the touch screens available for them, though. Yes, but they have to be ca calibrated right, and there's not space to put one that's not the right size, you know, unfortunately. So any other questions or comments? No? Thank you. Thank you. I thought I'd actually do a talk as well, because um, I've built a custom case for my front end, which I thought might be of interest to a few people, because back when I looked at doing them, they were rather expensive. However, milling one out of wood would be kind of cool. <laughs> so um, that's a picture of my steering cam taken a few days ago, and uh, yeah, okay, there is some old cut in there, there is a DVD player. It works better than with TV. <laughs> Sorry. What you can't see is the VCR, which is down here, which hasn't been turned on. In fact, it's not hasn't been plugged in for about five years. Don't use it as a clock. <laughs> we, we did, but you can you can see the wooden trim around the door that covered the clock on the VCR. <laughs> so, what's the point? Uh, who can spot the front end in that cabinet? Wrong. No, the Correct. The second from the bottom. You can just see the DVD logo in the photo. So I wanted a front end that fitted into my stereo cabinet. Admittedly, using a retro 80s CD player case, maybe not such a great choice, but... Do you have a rectangular hole at the back for the venting? No, I've got a 120mm case fan cut in the top. <laughs> and I'll show you why in a moment. <laughs> uh, yeah, I need a learning remote, um, you know, when the budget permits. Uh, but, you know, why do I do it? Computer cases, big, ugly. Component cases weren't easily available four and a half years ago when I built this thing. And as they were then, and still are now, they are bloody expensive. So what did I do with my case? Well, I spent about, you know, when I thought, hey, 
I could do this. I spent a couple of months going around trying to find old broken cases that people didn't want anymore. You know, I went around to second hand shops and they were like, no, 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 we'll charge you 50 bucks for that. We'll charge you 100 bucks for that. And until I happened to go around to a mate's place who was moving house, he had just sold his house, was moving and said, oh, can you take this old CD up to the Bergspin up the top of the drive? I had one quick look at this one and said, hell no, I'll take that home. So this was when I started off with it. Love the retro 80s look. <laughs> Beautiful. It hadn't worked for 10 years. First thing you do, you gut it. Who needs all of that stuff? Then you try and make things fit in it. <laughs> so yes, the via EPA M10K, still in use. I want to buy an uh, NVIDIA card to go into it now. Uh, I've taken the old CD mountings and mounted the DVD drive to it because at the time when I bought all this kit, I didn't have the DVD player. All this kit sat in the cupboard for about a year before I actually got the case to start building it and until I got the capture card to actually you know, be the catalyst to do it. So make sure it all fits. And then because we actually used this hardware to watch Myth TV, it went back into the cardboard box it was living in. So I could actually watch TV that night. <laughs> <laughs> the network cable, power, and uh, AV is coming out somewhere as well, but you can't see it. I think it came out there. <laughs> the reason for the box, the cat liked to, to sit on it. <laughs> So you ever get the box down? down. No. <laughs> so that was actually what it looked like when I first finished it. Um, sitting in there somewhere. I can't actually see which one it is, but it's apparently there somewhere. Uh, initially when I built it, I um, just, if we just go back a few th pages. I didn't actually get a chance to take a photo of it as the finished unit. Um, I was going to do that, but I ran out of time before coming, coming over here. But I ripped off the old CPU fan, put in a 120 more case fan, totally passive. It's network boot. It is totally stone silent. No noise whatsoever. It's fantastic. No, uh, the fan's silent. 120 more case fan. That is. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I can't hear it. <laughs> My wife can't hear it. Therefore. <laughs> True, but we no longer have to turn up the TV to, to be able to mask it. <laughs> No, not on this, not on this hardware. Um, we've only recently started being able to get high def in New Zealand. I don't have the right capture card gear to get it in New Zealand at, the, at this stage. I need a DVD T card, and Stephen's a good person to talk to about that. It's not worth it. When I start doing HD, I'm, I'll get an NVIDIA PCI card to put in, this, in the case. All by an ION. Oh. And you know, that would fit in that space. <laughs> uh, also worth knowing, I've never actually used a DVD player in this case. I put it on, I, I think we tried to use it once to try and watch something that didn't work in the DVD player in the real one, it didn't work here either. So. so that's how simple it is to make a custom case for your front end. Uh, it took me, the case was, was free, 10 bucks worth of parts, um, and start to finish probably a month of Saturday afternoons. I'm just using the standard 60 watt one that you can buy from Morex. That's at the top. That's, that's the power supply. That's a DC DC converter. And there is an AC to DC ba uh, power brick. That sits outside the case. Uh, 
which there are no photos of there, but, uh, you know, yeah, <laughs> everybody's got one here. Yes, yes I have. I still have <coughs> that panel because the original idea was to glue it onto the, the tray. Yeah. Uh, the IR receiver, I cut off that bit of plastic there which is clear plastic, yeah. put the IR mount in there and I've got a, another panel which sits over there so you can't actually see them through the receiver. Yeah. And yes, the plan was to wire up the buttons to actually do stuff and replace that unit there with a VFD or something like that. However, that all takes time and money. Uh, the VFD displays are a couple hundred bucks US, a couple hundred US dollars. Um, that power button does actually work. It's all wired and, and functional. Uh, and other control panel buttons, yeah, yeah, I could do it, but you always use the right control. So why bother with the front panel buttons? Um, and besides, you want to have up, down, left, right, enter. At, at, least, at least going with the IR receiver will be a relatively useful and relatively straightforward uh, one to implement. Yeah. It's, uh, the, the build a serial port infrared receiver is you know, $10 to $15 in New Zealand. And I, you know, I built one on a, on a PCB yeah. just behind there. And it's just wired up to the serial port headers on the motherboard. On the back, there's RCA jacks for the audio, so it's all integrated. Maybe you just rig up the uh, buttons on the front panel to play a, a sample of someone saying, use the remote control. <laughs> 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 At least wire up the eject buttons. Of all of them, that's the only one you might get in. However, the because we never use a DVD player. <laughs> <laughs> This machine's a bit too slow to take stuff off DVD anyhow. And it, there's no hard drive local. So anything which I want to, um, you know, if I get a copy of something from someone, then that might happen to be done on my workstation, which is a much crankier machine and makes a heck of a lot more noise than this. Yeah. Any other questions about crazy things like this? I would actually be kind of tempted to do the same thing again because all the home theater PC cases I've seen are big and chunky and I want something which kind of fits, fits into, this, into the cabinet and you know, it doesn't stand out too much. The other thing is that the slimline ones are either, they're still quite expensive and also you're quite limited in what motherboards you can put into them and what expansion or possibilities you've got. Having said that, since I built this, I haven't expanded it. I've put no other cards into it. Um, I haven't even made it. I've got the PCI riser card, but I haven't actually cut any holes into the case to be able to mount anything. So that's one thing I have to do if I get a, a new graphics card for it. Um, you know, take a Dremel to it and, and make some holes. But that's easy. Any other questions? Cool. It's easy. Do it yourself. <laughs> Um, oh, and I should say, when I first started doing this, my wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, thought I was crazy. Then, no, why are you wasting all this time? She would never go back. <laughs> it's fantastic. Right, well, that's kind of. Uh, anybody else got a, any lightning talks they want to. Okay. What we can, can do now is we've got, got two options. We can either get. Um, the various speakers who have been doing things up here and to, to have a bit of a panel and answer questions from people if people got questions they want to ask. Or we can head off and find a pub somewhere nearby and continue discussions there. Do we, you know, who, who's in favour of doing a panel kind of thing? A couple. Ha yep. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, shall we do that then? Now, I believe that the uni bar might be open, but that's kind of been a bit doubtful. Okay, in that case. The other suggestion has been to go to, to the St. Ives or Eves or something like that. Any locals have any thoughts or preferences as to what might work better? Is there anywhere like that nearby? <laughs> well, maybe we should try and have, have a, a little bit of a panel first here. If uh, people have got questions they want to ask, and then we can um, wander somewhere else that can people can. You don't have to be able to hear people. Can I borrow the mic for a minute? Yeah, sure. Uh, this isn't entirely altruistic because some of you might know I've been shipping Myth TV commercially in New Zealand for a number of years. With one of the aims being of actually making enough money to pay some of the developers to do some work, um, sadly it hasn't taken off that well. But uh, it isn't, isn't something I've given up on. And given the number of Myth TV users here, I'd be quite interested to hear what your opinions are in terms of where Myth TV should be going because I'm predominantly dealing not with you guys, but with real consumers. And they've got some very interesting and quite different views from what I was expecting in terms of uh, what they want from a PVR stroke home theater PC product. So, I mean, you know, if you, in terms of blue skying it, what would you like to see Myth do? Paul. Yeah, with with the multi rec uh, project to get multi multiple streams recording on DVB, um, that was actually partly or the, the development time was actually fully paid for by a Finnish company, I think it was Finnish, um, who also sought donations from the community. I put put in some money from that for that. Um, my impression had been, and I'm happily happy to hear this is wrong. Um, but my impression had been that Isaac was generally against um, people putting money for particular features that they wanted to see Myth TV developers work on, um, because uh, because of the skew in what that what tickets and what projects get work on worked on. And I think Steve's Steve, your point that. Um, there are customers out there who have quite different expectations of what they want out of Myth TV versus what the developers and what the, the people uh, are. So I'm interested to see what the feeling is with paid for tickets as well. well one big bugbear I've had from a lot of people is um, what you can play it back on at the end of the day. Um, was mentioned earlier some of the new devices have got UPnP support in the device. Uh, anyone see the, the demos Intel did about the really cool new media stuff they're doing in the TV and they've got all this widget stuff they're developing with Yahoo and all this cool and crazy shit. And really at the end of the day where it's going is why can't I have an interface IPTV or UPnP based run on a PS3, run on a Samsung TV, run on a Sony TV, and have Myth as just the best damn back end it can be. I have everything going over it. Because right now, I can't do live TV on those devices. I can't do the program guide on those devices. And then, we have Myth as the Uber back end. We can do the front ends if we want, but really, we make it agnostic in terms of what it's delivering to. And that's what I'm kind of seeing in terms of all this technology has been put into the TV. Those TVs can do all the high def playback in hardware. So why do I need to try and build a front end that can do it? I was going to say that the PS3 and Myth have actually talked to each other. Yeah, but yeah they, they talk to each other, but you can't do live TV. You can't program. You don't get all of the features. Yeah. No, well, it shouldn't need tuners. It should talk to the back end to get the live TV and have it streamed to it. 
Um, the other observation I had on that theme was I was talking to a person in, I think it was LCA 2007, who was saying uh, they hated Myth TV because as far as their opinion was, a media player should be have a be, just appear in a window and it should give you a list down the left hand side of all the recordings and then you select it and it's be a GUI, right? And this would be, I said, well, you know, okay, why not integrate with the Myth TV back end where, where all the work has been done on the smarts to get recordings happening well and just write the, the front end. And this is the sort of the tragedy of that, well, I've got this great idea, so I need to write it from scratch problem. Is so, anyone playing with Totem and Myth TV? Totem and Myth TV? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it seems to work okay-ish with my back ends, but it's nowhere near as robust. It's, not, it's nowhere near as full-featured. Actually, what I'm, one of the biggest complaints in most respects with the Myth GUI is it's got too many features. You know, the whole, like, I've got to change the menus and dump some of it down. I've got to hide half the features and turn off half the plugins. As a consumer, goes in and goes, what's Netflix? Well, it kind of doesn't work in New Zealand. I will turn that off. Oh, how do I use my phone? Uh, no, that's probably not going to work really with your ISP, so I'll turn that bell. You know, and you just start reducing what you've got. But at the end of the day, if you'd like trying to deliver this through a, a TV as the interface, through UPMP, through IPTV or whatever, you actually you only need to present a small portion of the functionality. So what, what else would you guys want to see it do? What, what, what features would make it a 1.0 release? <laughs> Stability is number one, of course. So as far as you're concerned, it is a 1.0 release. It's just stability. I think you also need to be able to make sure the play is well, I'll have to speak into that. Um, it needs to be able to deal with any media, anything you're going to watch or listen to, whether it's your TV or your music or anything like that. If you're just going to play TV, I mean, your home theatre system is not a TV, it's your stereo system and all that sort of stuff as well. So to be able to watch the TV and play your music and be able to do it in a way that's nice and simple and ultimately the back end is where everything is and you can be wandering around with your iPhone listening to your music from your TV over your wireless network, whatever, throughout the whole place. That's what place. you like, you say you to go for the whole um, TV. If you go for the whole TV as the interface thing, you've got to do a lot of on-the-fly transcoding because you've got to know what the TV can support. Because it might not support Og as a container or MKV. It might not support some of the internal codecs and all the rest. I mean, Myth's got a hell of a lot better. I mean, these days, you can throw a reasonable amount of audio and video at it. And anything else you can shell out. You know, use mPlayer, use something else. I think this, uh, one of the things that sort of for us at home is that um, for general purpose sort of stuff is that, you know, you don't want to have your TV on if you just want to play a CD. So as a general purpose, you know, for watching television, it's great, it's wonderful, it works great. But if you want to play a CD, you know, if I give a CD to the kids, they won't go to the meth TV and put it on because they've got to switch on the television and everything else. So, you know, just from that point of view, maybe, I don't know how you'd handle that, um, but... You know, if we're going to start going down, you know, showing, doing handle CDs and photos and stuff like that, then you've probably got to start thinking about alternative ways of getting to it. Actually, I, I noticed um, your problem I had a couple of weeks ago trying to program up a um, Harmony remote control and a MCE infrared receiver. And I discovered... I wasted a couple of days doing going around in circles, but I discovered the programmable buttons part of Myth TV, which has got another problem itself. But it also has jumps where you can you can set, especially something like a Harmony, where you can send random remote control. Uh, you could actually have a button to tell it to jump straight to the CD ROM to, to, to the CD menu and start playing without without doing anything other than hit a button on the uh, 
on the road mode control. Yeah, and this is it. You could use one of those hot buttons. We ship the standard Harpage uh, MC compliant remote control with our box, and we've actually programmed all the hotkeys. So when you hit live TV, it uses the jump stuff and actually goes to live TV. Guide takes you to the guide and so on. And um, when we first shipped, that wasn't set up. It was the biggest complaint we had with the first customers was that those hotkeys didn't do what they expected. Once we had that in place, we never had a customer thank us for them being there because it was an assumption they would just work that way. Uh, my brother was very impressed uh, when he got his new iPhone and he found that he could plug in a Myth TV interface that would basically control the front end. He's got his iPhone on whenever he, wherever he goes. The, about the only thing he doesn't have is the player on that being able to talk to um, his home media server, but if he can pr program the front end, which doesn't have to have a TV turned on in order to, to run it, then that's playing music or you know, even giving him un other information from there. But we kind of missed one point there. Why are you doing using a CD? Why isn't your music on the network? And in that regard, why isn't Myth really good at dealing music to squeeze box or whatever other media devices you've got around your house. You, know, you, you want it to be this general purpose thing. What that to do is put a DAP server on the same box and put a squeeze box server and put all these other things on the same box and they don't share metadata. Now UPnP and what's the other one? The UPnP on steroids, the one that uh, Intel goes on about now. Um, DLNA. DL, DLNA or DNLA. Um, it's supposed to take care of all of this. It's still a little bit, not less than ideal, but it's getting better. And you know, this is where we can really stand out and make a huge difference. We work with all these devices, so it's automatically there at the back end. I guess one thing to say about the, the audio side of things was we used to use Myth Music, but you know, we got frustrated with having to turn on the TV. So now I run line level audio from the server in another room through to this the amplifier, and there's another remote control, and that plays a jukebox. And I use Music PD to, to do that because, you know, it works. That way we've always got music. If you want it, you just turn on the amp. And there's no mucking around, and I've set up the, uh, buttons to rotate through the playlists on the remote control so that, you know, we can listen to kiddies music or we can listen to ground music. It works nicely. I'm running line level audio about six to eight meters over Cat5. In fact, it's running longer than that because it's coiled up because I, that was the length of core which I happen to have, have lying around. No, but it's running about 20 meters of actual cable. Hey, it sounds fine. I'm coming back to the UI. I mean, how many people have seen the PlayStation 3 Play TV demos? Uh, you look at things like, um, what's Max 1? Front row, and things like that. And then you try and persuade them to use Myth TV, and they go, you what? Um, it's, the new UI's kind of getting there. Um, and it's going to be really hard, because what kind of UI do you do if you're doing it remotely to a device? Well, can those devices simply navigate to a... a the sexy stuff you can do now on a web page, if that, if that can be driven on a TV, you can give it a reasonably sexy UI. And when you click the button, it just goes to the stream. You, you, said, you mentioned front row, but the Apple TV had front row in its first revision, but no longer does. And now that the UI on Apple TV is bad, it's really quite bad. Mm -hmm. I and mean, it's got a decent menu structure, but it, it looks like, I mean, the only reason it doesn't look te like a text-based UI is Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do any of you use things like uh, Transcode off for other devices, like your PSP or an iPhone or a? Yeah, I, I get a lot of requests for that. The fact that if I actually offer that in New Zealand, I will be possibly facing imprisonment under the new copyright amendment bill. <laughs> oh, that's fun. 
Don't do that in New Zealand. You will be arrested. Another one is um, like some stuff you've done on, on media detection. I mean, one of the ones is like s I, I, people wander up and like they plug their iPhone or something or iPod Touch or PSP or whatever in to the myth box and expect to be able to just browse the media and for it to just be where they expect it. And that, that's something else people are rather cool. Oh, there's lots of things. Can't do that. Yeah. That competes with that. Yeah. <laughs> That's probably yeah. illegal in most countries. Oh, I don't care about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, you could compile. Um, if you run, if you booted it Linux, you could do a native Myth TV front end. The problem you've got is you don't get full access to the video acceleration. Uh, one reason FFmpegs got a lot better was to make the video scale on cell, because it didn't, and it was just really bad. It was struggling to do MPEG-2. Then, then the objective there is to write MPEG-2, and this is the thing that the Oslabs guys were saying, that they have write MPEG-2 libraries, um, H.264 decode libraries for the cell beings, mm. yeah, the, for the SPUs, because mm. that's exactly what they're designed to do. Yeah. The, the fact that they can run four-dimensional Mandelbrot ren rendering as a ray tracer in real time, or um, a, in real time ray, ray tracing on three P PS3s across a network, compressing and decompressing parts of frames on the fly through these things. Um, there's gobs of, of, mm -hmm. of processing power. We just have to use it. Yeah. And that's without even being able to touch the, the, the video hardware. Yeah, so, so Myth TV as it stands is pretty good enough. Yeah, in, uh, in the program Try two to four hundred channels. It just doesn't scale. Uh, yeah, I, I just can't cram everything into something. One thing we did was have very good support for Sky set top boxes, control them via IR. And so we have Sky New Zealand's program guide, the analog UHF program guide, and the Freeview terrestrial or satellite program guide, all in a single view screen so that when you choose say, channel one it will default based on quality to whichever one of the three sources it can possibly tune to and getting that all to kind of make any sense for a consumer to use in the end we decided we couldn't afford to give them the choice we have to make the choice for them otherwise it just got too difficult but we're about to get one of those things that's happened in the uk plus one channel whoa great use of our bandwidth uh, so we're getting TV3 plus 1. TV3 is available in HD. Plus 1 won't be. Don't quite get that. But all of a sudden, you're going to have the same program available at two different time slots, but effectively the same channel. How the hell do you manage your program, guys? This is the one thing that prevents people from using the front end on the TV totally. You can't do it. Yeah. Use MythWeb? I think the answer is that most people use MythWeb. 
because it is so much faster to, to do program scheduling. So much faster. Kate watches much, much more TV than I do. And I think the two things that she would like the most, firstly, uh, I think the, the, instead of using the program guide as a list of time versus channel, she just chooses by program name because she's looking at the paper guide, which is she knows exactly what she's looking for. Um, so quick selection of that. And that basically then um, she just says, record when this program is on once per week on any channel and at that point it will say okay this program's available on channel 2 and on channel 22 so I will pick it, pick it off ABC 2 because it's a, it fits in a better start time slot so that's uh, that, that's pretty much there and that would be the way Kate uses the, you know, just never touches the program guide because it's far too cryptic um, but the one thing that she would really like is basically users in with TV. And I'm happy if someone says there's a pr plugin to do it, but um, to be able to, the, the interface is quite simple. Each program gets tagged with one or more people that can that are interested in that program. So a recording schedule. Then you simply say, you know, change user, you know, current user, Paul. Kate goes to current user Kate and it shows her programs and at that point she doesn't have to worry about because her complaint is your programs, my programs, are filling up the, pro the, the recorded list, right? I can't find the programs that I want to watch in amongst all of your stuff so can't you delete some? And my answer is no because it's a recording device and I just throw more storage at it but if she could just have only her programs or only the, the programs with her name recorded against them, shown, that would be fantastic. That would be a 1.0 feature for me. Is it? But Paul's talking about context. I log in as Kate, I see this. I log in as Paul, I see that. Yeah. The, that you can have a playback group called Paul's stuff. Oh, yeah. I know. But how do you then say to the UI which... which Okay. No, I'm. I'm. I haven't looked at that. Look, looked at recording groups. Can Can I say this program is in two recording groups? Probably not. You probably have to have all of us or something. Right. police show that's suitable for children, then you have to pick one of the two, which is annoying. Um, I'd like the uh, re list of recordings to not suck when I have four or five hundred recordings, thanks. <laughs> um, I think you need a unit test with a very, very large number of entries. Like, it takes 30 seconds to paint that menu when it's running on the same machine as the back end, because the sequel's just really big. Half a second's too slow. It's still human perceivable. It has to be under 200 <laughs> milliseconds. <laughs> That's where you have the funky OpenGL transition. <laughs> Get a faster machine. To slow that down. <laughs> Actually, uh, just hearing about the, the recording stuff, recording schedule reminds me of the, the one thing that feature that I really want to see, and that is record one co copy of this program any time during an evening during the week. Yeah. Because we have shows that are on during the day, and you know that's the that's the repeats from two years ago, and then the new episode is that evening. And if you say record one show, you get the the one that you saw two years ago. Because well, <laughs> MythWeb has the recorded any t recorded this time slot. Yeah. If you just made it record in this rough time slot. Yeah. As well as that would also fix the recording this yeah, time slot. Yeah. yeah. Plus or minus two hours. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. An hour or two, not a few minutes, because mm. some schedules move a lot. Yeah, so that, that, that's the one thing I, I've been thinking, you know, uh, over the last couple of years. I should really have a look and see how we'll, we'll take to add that feature. But uh, another, another way to approach that would be to 
say, uh, sorry, another way to approach that would be to say, uh, record this program as long as this, you know, the year field was greater than this. Uh, well, we don't have that metadata in the EPG. And you can do it. You okay, do if, you, if you do, um, and we've already talked about, you know, having to go in and add or change the data in the, the database, if you know that it's always going to be in the, the midday shows, the one from two years ago, then? Well, TV Anytime actually removes most of that because you say, okay, well, the one that's happened recently is the UK show Wild at Heart, and they started repeating the first two seasons over Christmas during the day, and all of a sudden you're not recording the new ones. But what you can say is, oh, well, series link it, I want to record season three with, or plus. Or it'll remember the fact it's already recorded seasons one and two, and therefore it won't go back and record them. And um, uh, that's where the TV company, especially like uh, TV Anytime has been rolled out in the UK and it's about to be rolled out in New Zealand. Or it's kind of semi-working with the HD PVRs in New Zealand. But do you trust them to get it right? Uh, well, yeah, I see the one trusting them to get it right. And yeah. I'm um, not on the theory that if they screw up the <coughs> metadata, that has a direct consequence on their viewership. No, it doesn't. They don't. Oh, you got to remember, TV companies exist to provide advertisers a conduit. They don't exist to provide programming in most places. So I've, why are you using yeah, yeah. This is this is true. Yeah, that that would be good because it'd be really nice to say, okay, can I please buy a season of Lost and just uh, have it delivered to me? I've got one common thing I've had from a number of customers. I'm wondering if this is something that, that anybody else would want. They expect that they can assign the number of tuners they've got to their favorite channels. And they will be recorded as long as nothing else is being recorded. Always. Just in case they ever want to go back and watch something. or Myth TV, basically to keep all uh, tuners busy just recording a la the last N, uh, or you know, say the last 24 hours, the last 48 hours, so that at some point he can go, you know, someone can say, oh, I watched this really cool episode of Blah last night, and you go, oh, okay, you know, go back, grab that episode out of the, the recorded, and it will just save it and just disc copy at that point. Plus, that's really valuable for educational institutions. I know school hours that had a bank of like eight VCRs precisely to record things of an evening. Like the national news all got recorded plus half a dozen other things that people requested. But if you could just keep tuners keeping back, I mean a week would be ideal and it's not hard, it's not much disc. That's a really great thing to be able to offer. with multi the guy picked up on multi realised that with two tuners you could record seven or eight channels that he was interested Stone, in saturated. and he wanted to record seven to eight channels and how much storage would he need to have a week, a month, a year's worth of programming? Well, uh, who was the, uh, there was a guy that owned a motel in Canada. Detect Some interesting numbers involved. Well, I was going to say, detect um, repeats and it's not really that much storage. Yeah, yeah. there was a, there was a yeah, guy, lights, yeah. <laughs> There's a guy that owned a motel in Canada who um, he had a license to be able to show any shows within the, it might have been a hotel, motel, whatever, that he could show any shows. So he had a TV set up that just recorded everything that he could receive. And it got to the stage where he stopped recording things because he had recorded everything. <laughs> and that was a few years ago that he had a shitload of tuna set up and, and doing that. <laughs> Scott, did you swerve? I think with program guides, though, that's going to have to improve as we've now got increasingly like the Freeview HD and the Sky HD that if they screw it up at their end, they're going to get so many f uh, phone calls in. So I think program guides are going to have to get better as more and more people start having um, PVRs and stuff like that because they do, I mean, if, if they get lots of complaints. And Sky New Zealand's really popular with program guides a few times recently. Freeview's favourite one is got like savings, correct? <laughs>
between when it used to change and when it does change, your mid web is wrong, but mid is correct because you use the distribution times. So it's recording and you're going there. It's saying it's recording in an hour. 100 minutes on now, I don't want it recorded. That does explain a few things. But I mean, obviously using the system's TZ info library is, a, is way too complex. Yes, because we're being actually Um, a question for Julian or anyone really. I'm just curious as to what the actual disk usage figure is to record per channel per week, 24 hours a day. I'd have to work it out. Too. Yeah. I mean, it's what, 9 gig an hour for each high oh, I'm just trying to think. It's like 3 gig an hour for SD. And that's if you've got crappy signal that caused the MPEG stream to balloon. So, I mean, 2 gig an hour SD, 160, 300 gig per channel per week. And that's for a single SD stream by 5, 1.2 terabyte. What, 2 terabyte drives in at RAID 0, and you've got all the Australian free stuff for a week? Yeah. yeah. Um, where's the uh, H.264 streams in New Zealand? Our, um, our SD streams were uh, between 2 and 3 megabit for SD. Our uh, SD H.264 streams are about 1.5 megabit, which and actually look way better for because being H.264, so that drops things down. Our HD streams are about the same as Australia's MPEG-2 HD streams in terms of, you know, data per hour. But often, you're better off telling the PVR to go and record it off uh, the SD satellite service instead of the HD terrestrial because it use a lot less disk. And they won't notice the difference because most of the shows aren't in HD anyway. Well, yeah, uh, priority. So the only feature of my TiVo I miss is it learning that I'm planning a murder and recording all police shows no matter what. Do you love that? Well, so you read articles about you know people whose TiVos learn that they're gay or whatever, so they have to start watching you know cowboy movies for a bit to skew it the other direction. Um, it would be <laughs> it, it it would be good to have some sort of predictive, you know, hey, you like CSI, so maybe you'd like Bones. I'll go and record a single episode or whatever. No, uh, well, so you've got an implicit thumbs up. If you played it to the end of the program, you liked it. Or you walked out of the room, right? So, the, so the guide data, at least in the US, has category information. Like this is a drama, but you could also ask the internet, right? You know the program title. Uh, sure. Yeah, you know, like you could go and call, like you know, say Netflix's API and ask them what they know about CSI or whatever. You don't have to just use the guide data available from the TV station who hates you. Um, but yeah. Even like the Amazon recommendations for people who bought DVDs of this series would lead you to other DVDs of other TV shows you might like. There's all sorts of data yeah. that you think that So Amazon could be good. Data collector in Australia. Um, I, I don't. Yeah, I, d I don't use the the Shepherd data because I I use the um, OzTivo um, TV Guide Org AU. Um, but from what I've seen of Shepherd, it will go out and if it finds movies, it will then query IMDb for all its the information on those movies and a whole bunch of stuff like that. Um, yeah, absolutely, and the. The key with that kind of thing, and, it, and Shepard's very well designed in that um, it basically has, um, it schedules these things to go and be done when it needs to find information on those, these, these programs. Um, the, the key would be, I think, a lot of the people in this room would be able to add that kind of stuff to Shepard because it's constructed fairly well from what I've seen and um, it's the, the key thing to so much of this is thinking of the sources of information.
the developer has maybe gone to IMDb and maybe Netflix and gone, okay, well, that's, that's all I can think of right now. And there may be a, a whole bunch of others, other ones to look for. So, yeah. You've got to be clear, careful, though. I mean, in the case of Shepard, some of that data has been normalised and sanitised. All it takes is one slight typo by the programmer. And your IMDb look up may pull up some quite interesting data that you weren't expecting. <laughs> All the fun and games possible there. Yeah, is to start correlating some of it and say, well, this, this one seems to have a completely whacked out title compared to every other listing here. I'm going to ignore that. Yeah, I was actually... At least a lot on normalising New Zealand's data. Yeah. We've, and that's still a work in progress going on there. Um, as we find more things that are wrong in the EPG data that we can correct. You know, mm. adds, adds another another rule to it. So I was. Are you adopting the TV anytime stock? There's almost no excuse because they they should be loading the programs in by their 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 own standards. Yeah. 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 Yeah.